In this conversation with Dr. Elizabeth Bright, we talk all things hormone function and thyroid function and how at a very young age, there are signs that show if you are having too much cortisol output or too little cortisol output and that how it will affect your overall endocrine or hormonal function and health. There are symptoms that can show that you may be hypothyroid at a young age. And we also talk about how birth control pills and certain types of medications at a young age can affect your overall thyroid and hormone function. Hey guys, my name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And that often starts with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. Today, I have the pleasure of bringing back Dr. Elizabeth Bright. She is an osteopath living in Italy, but she is a thyroid and hormone expert. And I had the honor of helping her write her forward for her new book, Good Fat is Good for Girls, Puberty and Adolescence. In this book, she talks about all things, how or what is considered normal for going through puberty, going through adolescence, what's the difference, what age is normal to get your menses, what happens when you start taking medication at a young age and how that affects you, how PCOS and endometriosis can happen, and what are some solutions to these different areas. It is very common and normal to take birth control pills at a young age, not because you are trying to literally stop a birth, but because of other reasons such as hormonal acne, maybe certain pains, if your period is not regular. And we see it so normalized, but is it a healthy thing? There are so many factors when you are taking birth control for so long that you can become nutrient depleted. There are so many minerals and vitamins that get affected when you have been taking birth control for so long. There's a page in carnivore cure where I actually bring that up. All medications, even supplements have a pros and cons. And the goal is always to take these things if the benefit outweighs the negative. But for many of these medications, we just don't know and we're taking it because doctor said so, but there are ramifications in the long run. We see it in our practice all the time. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. We talk about all things, hormonal health, thyroid function, and how at a young age, if we start taking different medications, synthetic hormones, it can affect us in our overall health and our ability to thrive. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. Bright. I'm super excited to have you on again. You are one of my most frequent guests that I love bringing on. And the most exciting thing is you, you have written a new book and I wanted to share it with everyone. If you could share a little bit about you and then about this new book and why you decided to write a book for a generation that's not yours. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. It's so great to be back again. I appreciate it. All right. So I wrote uh, Good Fat is Good for Women, which is for, for women, but all women and also men like reading it. And now I just published, or as of tomorrow, it'll be out, Good Fat is Good for Girls, Puberty and Adolescence. And I have two daughters. I have three children, and two of them are female. And they all went through adolescence. So I was very much, well, I've known this for a long time, but so many of their friends are on antidepressants. And they don't eat meat. So I kind of put the two together, and I wanted to show women and younger women and the mothers of younger women, how important, and also boys, they experience puberty as well. But how to address the health issues that are associated with puberty and adolescence, just as there are health issues associated with menopause, which is, you know, good fat is good for women. Menopause is uh, is addressing those supposed health issues. Absolutely, the health issues are real, but what are they caused by? Yeah. And you mentioned in your book, PCOS and endometriosis, what is it about those illnesses? But we know they're common, but in a sense, maybe it's not normal to have. And yes, yes. But it's not that they're, they are more and more common. Mm -hmm. That is the issue. More and more prevalent rates are higher and higher. And that's what I'm addressing. So what are the, the treatments? The treatment is more hormones because it's associated with a hormonal imbalance. Well, absolutely. But I also call, just like I've called breast cysts, goiter of the breasts, endometriosis and PCOS, endometriosis would be goiter of the uterus and PCOS could be goiter of the ovaries. These are, these are tissues that can very easily become hyperplastic. So what are those tissues looking for? They're looking for iodine. They're looking for balanced blood sugar. They're, lo- they're looking for a balanced endocrine system. 
So if the endocrine system is not balanced, the tissue will respond trying to get more of what it needs. And that is uh, hyperplastic. Yeah. So, I mean, that's one reason that young women shouldn't get on medications. Are there other reasons? And, you know, why is it so important that we are the healthiest we can be during you know, puberty and going through adolescence? Well, I I mean, I've noticed that most of my patients can link their current health issues in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s to their adolescence. And that's one of, you know, going into, so when you start researching something and it started with a personal interest, I have children, I was an adolescent too, obviously, but then I did so much research and I have many patients who shared this with me. So I looked into it a little bit you know, more or deeply. I did a deep dive into it, just like I did into the book about menopause. I mean, medications, what do they do? They suppress function. I mean, if you, if you, if you have an acute injury, then you need medication because you have to treat that. You have to, they have to sew your leg back on. They have to give, give you benzodiazepines that when they sew your leg back on, you don't go into shock because any kind of incision in the body will cause you to go into shock. So they have to give you things to mediate that response, basically a stress response. But, you know, a health issue other than a chronic health issue is not due to imbalance. It's not due to the absence of the medication. So we have to figure out, as you are, as you always say, we have to go to the root cause and the root cause is not the absence of that medication. Well, maybe we take a step back and just talk about what happens during puberty, how hormones change. Um, You mentioned in your book, a certain age that you're, that the brain grows until. So how is this all impacted when we then start using medication or we have nutrient deficiencies or we're not taking iodine or we're using hormone replacements? If you can just share a little bit of the lay of the land. Okay. So, so basically we were born where the fetus, there's a lot of hormonal change, right? Actually cortisol, all the, all of the androgens, cortisol, they, they, they are secreted in, in huge amount because it's not just a stress response. It's also growth, brain function. All these things are linked to the evolving, the developing fetus. There is a surge in hormones until, you know, birth, and then they go down until adolescence. Think of all the growth that's happening in a fetus when, you know, when it's developing in comes to term. So during adolescence, I mean, I like to use this just like I call menopause a birth. Adolescence, puberty is a birth because you're you're changing from one organ, from one kind of, you're changing from a child to being a fertile being. And in order to do that successfully, it's quite important to your physiology to be able to be a good fertile being, to be a fertile being that has healthy offspring. That's what, that's what nature wants. Uh, it doesn't, you know, so, so the, the balance is crucial and there will always be, if something is missing, there will be a negative feedback response to try to bring it back to balance. It's interesting that we, we talked about, you know, we're going to talk about pre- precocious puberty, but puberty in humans evolved to be in females 17, 18. So we weren't supposed to be fertile beings at eight, nine, and 10. Menstruation indicates this person is now fertile, so they can get pregnant. Does did we evolve to get pregnant that young? No, we did not. We our our brain it does it's it's neuroplastic until basically the the age of twenty eight. So it doesn't really have to do with puberty in that sense because we know in adolescence I, I I make a distinct distinction between puberty and adolescence because adolescence is associated and now more even older with Puberty is associated with menstruation, forming formation of sexual characteristics, and then adolescence is associated with something different. I would say talking back to your parents, you know, wanting to, you know, drive a car. I mean, it's it's different. It's not this the formation of sexual characteristics. So the brain actually continues to develop until to grow until the age twenty eight. There's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of hormones, ha- a lot of hormonal changes happening. A lot of signaling going on. And all of that actually is triggered by thyroid hormone, which is basically the ringleader. You know, it's the, we've heard this a million times, thyroid is the, the, uh, the conductor of the orchestra. And it definitely is. So thyroid hormone basically triggers this change to make a child into a fertile entity that can then have 
offspring. The thyroid hormone, for example, the need for TSH gets released from, I think, the pituitary, which affects the brain. So if your brain is growing, but then you're taking exogenous hormones, and what hormones would you even take as a young child? So that's like one question. But how does that impact that? Then how does it as as a brain is developing, but then you're taking something outside that would produce some of the stuff that the brain would be signaling? How does that affect people's health and development? Well, the thing that's interesting is that these hormones that they're p- taking, the synthetic hormones that they're taking, aren't really recognized by the body as such. Okay. So what, what your receptors are looking for, the hormone cascade, it starts, the steroid hormone cascade starts as cholesterol, mm-hmm. right? And then it turns into, in both the ovaries and the adrenal, in the ovaries and the adrenals, and it turns into all these different hormones. So on the left side of the cascade of the chart, there's the stress response, right? And on the right side, there's all the way at the end, there's testosterone and then estradiol. So in order for it to get all the way over there, things have to be quite balanced. What what synthetic hormones actually do is they're not like, they're not replacing the testosterone, the estrogen, they are raising cortisol levels. And that absolutely has an effect on the brain. Okay. And then in terms of a hormone medication, birth control, is that a hormone? Yes, but they raise cortisol levels. Right, right. They actually raise cortisol levels and that's how they are a wrench in the works and the HPA axis and the HPT axis. They're this, basically this tongue, this wrench dropped into this delicate net of all these things connected together to each other and it throws everything off. It causes a stress response in the system. So you could say, I mean, we know that cortisol can affect amygdala formation, cortex formation, all these things are affected by cortisol. So that's really what those hormones do. And they, the reason why so many you know, women say this made me feel better when they took the hormones, they raise their cortisol levels. Okay. And when they, I mean, so you can, you're giving a child, an eight-year-old, because she has ADHD, which is actually what is happening, contraceptive, the contraceptive pill. I didn't know that. Is not, is, yes, yes. Rather I know they than gave giving, it for hormonal they, acne. I didn't know that they gave it for yes, that, yes, that young. Because, because, I mean, they don't want to give the girls amphetamines because right. since they're girls, and of course, the girls need hormones, even though they're eight, nine, and 10. Right. And, and they, and that supposedly the hormones will modulate cognitive function. That's what they tell menopausal women, don't they? Mm-hmm. You're going to lose your brain right. if you don't take synthetic, you know, HRT. They do the same. They say the same thing to the eight-year-old. So they have, they have kind of swerved from amphetamines for ADHD to birth control pills. Do they get on these birth control even before getting their menses? Yes, yes, because they are trying to modulate their behavior. Because what do women need? They need their behavior modulated. So, I mean, you mentioned earlier that some girls get their menses way earlier than we ever were supposed to. What is causing us to get our menses early? Well, as I describe in the book, carbohydrates. Because it wasn't until we invented agriculture and started eating grain that menstrual ages plummeted. So the more carbohydrates you eat, the earlier a girl is going to menstruate. And hunter-gatherers, 17, 18. And we have seen through history, and all those papers are in my book, basically, how not just the, the age of menstruation lowered, but also the actual formation of the hips. Birth, baby giving birth became a lot more dangerous and painful with the advent of agriculture. But what is it about carbohydrates that would then make you get your menses earlier, which then, you know, we're developing faster in a sense than is ideal? Sugar. Okay. But what is it about sugar? I'm just going to try. Okay. So instant levels, uh, cortisol, it's a stimulant. Okay. Uh, It's that wrench into the uh, endocrine system. The, our human endocrine system evolved to eat meat and fat, full stop, did not evolve to eat carbohydrates. When we ran out of meat and fat, we didn't die if we ate a handful of berries. Maybe a bunch of our forebears died eating a few vegetables and you know they figured, oh, well, let me ferment this and fewer will die. So, but that's really, that's really what it is. I mean, it's, it's quite frightening if you read about what happened to humankind 
since, you know, as how our bodies change and our lifestyles change with the advent of, of agriculture. Okay. So then my understanding is that because we're adding carbohydrates, which essentially all carbohydrates eventually turn into some type of sugar, sugar stimulates mm-hmm. cortisol, which is basically a stimulant. And that excess yes. sugar is developing us way quicker than is normal. And then maybe the excess and turning on of the endocrine system or the hormonal system more quickly then is causing all of these imbalances that we then need to even, instead of fixing the root cause issue of maybe reducing carbohydrates, we're then taking in other hormones to be, maybe balance whatever is imbalanced in the system, but it's actually like a huge band-aid. It's a mess. Yes. And now, unfortunately, the our society has always equaled having more babies with good nutrition, mm-hmm. good, you know, because the more hands you have in, in the fields, the more agriculture, you know, the more bread you can grain, you can grow, but we didn't evolve to eat, have 12 children. We right. evolved to have two and three max. And that was just fine with our bodies. So the association has never been only, only until recently that the carbohydrates caused us to have this earlier menstruation. And thus we had many children. Oh, so that was a good thing because the more children you have, the more people can go to war and the more people can work in the field. So that's not necessarily a good thing for humankind because the more children you have, the more, you know, it's incredibly nutritionally expensive. The person is having, you know, they died very young. They had too many children. After about three years, your body will fully replete itself with nutrition so that you could have your next baby. So are you saying that after every single baby that you will never have a net, the same amount of nutrition or wellness as when you didn't have a baby? No. Okay. So it, it, we evolved to have a baby in, as you said, a space of every two or three years. You can't, I mean, but a lot of people who have many children don't wait, can't wait that amount of time before they're pregnant again. Okay. So if you, if you're taking, if you're eating carbohydrates, progesterone levels are supposed to stay high when you're nursing, right? And that is supposed to be a form of birth control. But if you're eating carbohydrates, that's not going to work. Yeah, that makes sense. I nursed my second son for a very long time and I didn't get my menses back until the third year because I was still nursing him. So it totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. Based on everything you said, this might be somewhat controversial or probably very controversial, but I just want to ask anyway. So obviously if we get our menses early, it could be a sign that things are dysregulated, but we also then later see a menorrhea where people don't have their menses because maybe they're malnourished on the other side. And maybe their body is saying, you know what, we're in a more of a free state. I can't have you have a baby because you're not healthy enough to carry, but people still go and do hormonal replacements and they use IVF and they use all of these other supports to basically help them conceive. And then many people do in the end, but if the body, if nature is saying your body is not strong enough to carry a child, is there a risk when we use these new scientific methods to have babies that the baby just may not be as healthier because the mom is maybe there, maybe the mom had nutritional depletions, and then still did an IVF. And then, so she's able to carry, I don't know. It's just the logical brain of me thinks of that. Could there be risks with these? Right. Okay. So this, this is what could happen. I mean, obviously the technology will make ensure that to some extent that, you know, everything is working properly. Right. And yes, it is true that the body will not want you, would not allow you to conceive if things are, if not, if all the boxes aren't checked. Right. A big box is thyroid hormone. So lack of fertility is associated with low thyroid function. Mm -hmm. What often happens, and is what I didn't say, but, and this will be controversial, but if you've got 12 kids, probably the last six will be hypothyroid. Why? Because you have not been able to replenish the zinc, the thyroid, you know, the iodine, the iron, all of those things that are just completely used up by the nutritional needs of carrying a pregnancy to term. In order not to miscarry, often the pregnant woman will have to use the fetus's thyroid hormone. The thyroid grow is is developed at eight weeks. It's the first thing before the brain. Right. As soon as the neural tube is formed, the neural tube and the thyroid basically uh, form at the same time. So worst case scenario is that, you know, the mother doesn't have enough thyroid hormone. She will have to use the fetuses in order to not miscarry, which is, which is understandable, right? Physiologically. So that's, that's fine, but it's possible that the newborn may be not 
newborn necessarily, but during adolescence may have some issues because there was an nutritional issue, a hormonal issue during pregnancy. And then when I would say things get more nutritionally expensive, which is adolescence, which is what I'm talking about in the book, it can't kick in properly. So I can use my own daughter as an example. Not of that exactly, but my da- my youngest had a car accident when she was 18. She almost died. Her adrenals kept her alive. She went into shock. She stayed alive. I had to treat her adrenals. And I've told this to many patients. I had to treat her adrenal function for several years. When she became pregnant, she was never hypothyroid. When she became pregnant, I insisted that they test more where she was living. They didn't do free T3, free T4. And I insisted on doing that. And she was indeed hypothyroid. So I'm positive that her going hypo, you know, becoming hypothyroid is developing hypothyroid, low thyroid function was because of the shock to her system when she had that car accident. So she will be treating her thyroid until she's done nursing. And when you say treating, you mean like extra nutrients, certain lifestyle, no, natural desiccated thyroid, uh, and she ten drops of iodine. Uh, All my kids die, and I'm, you know, I produce it like you know, sending it to Greece, sending it to Scotland, and so that wasn't it. And it was she, she had the stress response. Trauma can cause low thyroid function because what is trauma? It is very nutritionally expensive. Yes. Yes. It's all about nutrients. That's what we're always talking about. If you have adequate nutrients and you can reduce the stress, you should be fine. I'm sure someone's going to think, well, why can't I just take a bunch of supplements then or a bunch of organ supplements or take like a, you know, eat a, a buffet of food that's so nutrient dense to just replete myself over time. But maybe that over time, maybe it just takes so long to get repleted. And so that's why it's even for your daughter, she just had to get on some natural thyroid support because- the that traumatic event was just such a immense stressor on her body that it maybe depleted her so much, but at least it kept her alive. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, it's like, you know, it, how will the car run if you're at the bottom of the tank? Right. You sometimes have to fill the tank a little bit for you to get up the hill. So if you're starting at the bottom of the hill, you have a tiny bit of gas and you, you know, try to rev the engine and get up this very steep hill, you're not going to make it unless you have a full tank of gas. I mean, there's a whole lot of other things going on. Sure. Well, oh. what are some other environmental factors that affect thyroid other than our diet, which is a huge one, I know. And I know diet, it's not just the carbohydrates, but there's also toxins in our and our pesticides and insecticides. But what are some big contributors as women are growing or uh, children are growing that affect the thyroid from properly developing and functioning? Fluoride in our water, bromide in our couches, and I don't know, PFAs, toxins, as you said, plastic bottles sitting on your dashboard, quercetin that everybody wants to take, tea they want to drink. I mean, the, the, the mint, I mean, all, all mint plants are, are goitrogens, millet, yams, so many things are brassica, broccoli. It's just, we didn't evolve to eat these things and we are just shoving them into our systems constantly. Now, if you're eating a high fat carnivore diet, you're kind of like by process of you're kind of like shoving some of those things. If you're eating more of the good stuff, a little bit of those things won't cause an issue, right? So, but if you have an issue, how are you going to fix it if you don't remove those things? Right. And I mean, I feel like that worked for me as well. So I was really strict carnivore for three plus years, just meats. And then nowadays I'll have a little bit of veg or a little bit of something, but, and it doesn't impact me, but 95, 98% of my diet is carnivore. So I agree. It takes a lot of people to do the elimination diet, to remove a lot of the toxins. So you're not affecting the immune system or the endocrine system to, Mm -hmm. so that they can start healing in your book. You had mentioned that antidepressants can affect thyroid and iodine function. And one, so I want to ask you, how does that happen? But besides Mm -hmm. the factors that you'll bring up, there is also just the, the medication itself. It is made of lactose, cornstarch, hypromello, so another type of plant, magnesium stearate, sodium lauryl sulfate, gelatin, titanium dioxide, and then it has it has food dyes of yellow and blue. So even without anything else you'll mention, the actual product itself and all the fillers they use, there's so many other toxins. A sulfate, the sodium lauryl sulfate, is what we use to make soap. So it's just other than even the mechanisms of what the actual drug does, the drug itself. I mean, if you don't give your children food dye, 
but there you're taking food dye with the, the yellow and the blue that's in this uh, medicine. And I think this one specifically was Prozac, but what is the danger of taking antidepressants or the effects on the thyroid and iodine? Well, if you talk about Prozac, I mean, we know that it they lower uh, lowers free T three and free T four levels. So that you have to go into the whole endocrine system again, though, right? You know, what do the what do they do? They're messing with cortisol levels. So I mean, they they have all these papers. It, you know, these people's cortisol levels went down temporarily while they were taking the medication. But it doesn't take into consideration what happens later. You can't mess with the cortisol system. If you mess with it, there'll be a negative feedback response later on. I mean, these medications lower thyroid levels. I mean, it just goes, I mean, I have so many papers that I discuss in the book about how this works and which ones do it. And I mean, it's medications are suppressing function. So of course they're going to lower thyroid. Thyroid levels, thyroid is a growth hormone. Things are supposed to be built with, if you have thyroid hormone, right? It's a building hormone. So if you're, if you're taking something that is basically negating your sympathetic nervous system, because that's what they do. Why is the sympathetic nervous system giving you anxiety? Why are these things happening? Because of this, this, and that. And if you gag that with the medication, these things are going to keep happening. So yeah, I mean, I I don't personally think that those, I mean, yeah, they're not great, but they're in so many other things. All medications have some kind of, I just don't recommend medications. So. And and then you mentioned steroid medications too. Obviously the cortisol is a type of steroid hormone, but what? So yeah. what are medications that children, adolescents would use that are steroid medications? Like what are some examples? And then um, obviously it's affecting cortisol, but is there anything else that these medications? Well, def- yeah, definitely the, the birth control. I mean, it's not just the steroids. If we're, okay. we're going to talk about the amphetamines that they are as well giving to the ones that aren't taking the birth control, they're taking amphetamines, which also have a huge knock on effect to uh, cortisol levels. The whole stress response in general uh, and the, you know, as you were talking about before, acne, you know, retinoids and all those things can cause all kinds of <laughs> issues with both cortisol and I, I mean, the, basically, basically, it's more the antidepressants that you were talking about mm-hmm. and the birth control. These are the major, major issues. So recently we went to the doctor and they were, they prescribed Aiden an asthma inhaler, but it's a steroid. So he doesn't have asthma. I think it's, we, we don't know what it is. It might be a food allergen. We're just figuring out that out now. They want him as a seven-year-old to take a steroid. And I know it, I know that some people need an asthma inhaler because they can't breathe, but does that also impact all of these things you're mentioning? What is asthma? Asthma is, is low cortisol. So, okay. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, just like PTSD is, is low cortisol. Eczema and psoriasis are low cortisol. It's your immune system has gone completely off the rails because there's not enough cortisol in your system. You're not, it, you know, usually it's because ACTH is not being secreted anymore by the pituitary and the adrenals are not, not being signaled to make cortisol. So after you've been, if you've been under stress for a really long time, eventually, because high cortisol levels are so detrimental to the body, the pituitary will no longer ask your adrenals to make cortisol. So you're left with low cortisol, maybe not every part of the day, but eventually every part of the day, and you will not have a stress response. So what does that mean? That means that, I mean, this is the analogy I use. There'll be 10 people in a line. They're all breathing the same air. One person has asthma attack. Why? Because their lung tissue is overreacting to, overreacting in the sense that it thinks that there's something wrong with the air and it is responding as if it were an antigen or a pathogen. Okay. That is what antibodies do, right? They are the, and any autoimmune condition is the immune system, which was a nice, happy immune system gone rogue. And it has become autoimmune because it has been kicked in the stomach so many times that it just, you know, starts shooting at everything. Could so it also happen during high cortisol too, because now I get the example, but if you're highly stressed, people also get eczema and autoimmune. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. Why? Because there's no more stress. If you have, if you have, if you've used up all your cortisol, if you if your cortisol is okay. always, high, you'll be at the ceiling, your head touching the ceiling, and you can't stand up mm-hmm. for stress, right? Or it's so low you can't stand up. Okay. And this Either is. Way. Yeah, they're both. They're both. I mean, you know. They're both not great. I've had many patients get off of their steroid inhalers because what is it doing? It's basically just 
gagging the immune system, which is saying, oh, no, oh, no, worry, 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 you know, shut up. Right. That's all it does. It's not fixing anything. Yeah. My mom was diabetic and during her sad diet. And then she eats meat based now and she doesn't need an inhaler at all anymore. And because she cleared her diet and she's no longer diabetic and she's not on any medication, she's not even on any hormone replacements. And she's 72. The meat based diet or carnivore diet has really helped her. So that makes sense. I knew yeah. inherently that I don't want to give my son a steroid, especially because he doesn't have moments where he can't breathe. So it's not just that. But I think maybe if I could just paint the picture of the reason why this cortisol and high or low and how these medications all impact that, and then it stimulates us to grow faster, or or we stop our period, all of these get impacted. And then how it affects everything else in the body is when your cortisol is high, or you're stressed, or your body is having imbalances in this endocrine system, then it absolutely impacts your digestion, because they are opposite. So when you're When you're highly stressed, your digestion shuts off because the body's focus on you dealing with the stressor. And so it does not think you're going to digest, but over time, if you're chronically stressed, that will then affect your digestion. And then your immune system is mostly in your gut, which is where your digestion happens. And so without all of these other things working properly, then your immune system won't even handle everything else, which then can make you sick or have asthma and get affected by many other things. Yeah, but it's also neurotransmitters that, you know, the adrenals also, all the neurotransmitters that are the catecholamines that are sent to address stress and... Yes, but a lot of the neurotransmitters such as serotonin is produced in the gut. And then if you're not properly digested, so it's all, it all works together. But if you're absolutely it's not working right because your cortisol is too high or even too low, then your digestion Mm -hmm. won't work. Then you won't produce the neurotransmitters that will then signal to the brain. So totally, I, I... I, I just wanted to make sure people understood it's not just a hormone thing because it's so easy, um, especially Everything. online, to see that I just suffer from a hormone issue. But you understand that that hormone issue then affects your digestion, affects thyroid, affects your ability to get iodine and then use it. So it's it's all interrelated. And I just want people to understand that. Right. It's definitely all interrelated. Absolutely. You can't separate the head from the body. So you can't, you know address head issues, opposed to mental issues by addressing only the head, because as you said, they're all connected. They absolutely are. So if I'm a young girl and I'm trying to, I, I have been told to take birth control pills, whether for the 80, which again, I did not know that they were doing that, but ADHD or because I have hormonal acne or, or like the other reason they say it is to regulate your period. What can mm-hmm. I do instead of using birth control? Because that seems like the easy fix. That is the recommendation that I heard even growing up and a lot of my girlfriends were on um, these medications, but what can I do then to support my system instead of getting on these medications? Well, if you get on those medications, you are going to have issues all through the rest of your life, which is the point of the book. Uh, Don't get on those medications because there is a reason why you're, you know, you're breaking out. Uh, There's a reason why your periods are regular. There's, there's a reason for that. So address that first. And that would be by high fat carnivore diet. You have to eat fat because that's what all the hormones are made out of. You have to have iodine. So your thyroid gets what it needs to, which you absolutely need as an adolescent to make thyroid hormone and address stress. So if you, if you are addressing stress already by having the proper nutrients in your system, Yeah. And there are people in the plant-based world that will say, well, most of your body produces its own cholesterol. So obviously that's an argument that therefore cholesterol is good for you, but they'll say, you don't really need a ton of external fat or fat from food because your body produces its own through the liver. But I think the gap that they don't understand is what if your liver isn't healthy because you're consuming so much sugar, but maybe if you can explain a little bit about if cholesterol is mostly made or abundantly made in a sense in the liver, then why do we need that extra fat? The liver absolutely makes some cholesterol, but we need so much cholesterol. So the human being evolved to have its high, you know, its brain, big, large brain, because of the huge amount of fat we're eating, animal fat, not olive oil, not avocado oil, animal fat. So that's how we evolved to eat that. So we have a gallbladder. Why do we have a gallbladder? To create a reservoir of bile to a reservoir for all that fat we eat. So it's not, I mean, yeah, the liver makes some cholesterol, but it doesn't make all the cholesterol we need. It's so crucial 
that it makes some cholesterol. But for us to be, we don't want to just be alive with some cholesterol. We want to thrive and not have to take antidepressants, hormone pill, you know, all these things and not get sick. So we need to eat more fat. Just being alive doesn't cut it for me. Right. And I also think it doesn't make all of it. I think it, the number was 70%. But I also think the logic of, okay, so if we know that the liver produces some levels of cholesterol, if you're getting fatty liver and you're also eating a lot of foods with a lot of toxins and you're exposed to lots of things, your liver isn't going to be functioning at its primal state. And so if it's not, then how do you think it'll be able to then make that or use all the resources to then produce cholesterol? If it, if you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from eating a lot of carbohydrates, your body's probably not producing the right amount of cholesterol or even have the raw materials to produce that healthy cholesterol. So it all goes hand in hand. If you're eating too much sugar, it will impact the liver anyway. And so you're not going to get the abundance of cholesterol too. And then if you're eating too much sugar, then it will impact your hormones and then impact growth and all of these areas. So I can see why a high fat carnivore diet will help. Do you think that younger children need to eat high fat carnivore as well? Oh, I don't think they need to eat as much fat as I think that they should okay. during adolescence and into uh, when they're fertile, they need more fat. Okay. Until they're fertile, I think that they, you know, they definitely need some fatty meat, but I don't think it has to be as high as it's the fertile, it's the, it's the quantity of hormones that are needed. It's quantity of cholesterol needed to regulate this basically exploding, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't use that word, developing, evolving, growing endocrine system that will create the fertile being that needs a lot of fat and protein. Right, right. Well, most fat comes with protein. So yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And then in terms of if you could go back to your old self, because you share a lot of your personal stories in your book, and it just makes you more human, because obviously, you're very intelligent. And you know, a lot of the the workings of the endocrine system, the hormones, the thyroid, and how the body functions, you talk touch nutrition. So it's a very well rounded book. But if you could tell your old self, this is how to properly go through adolescence, and then separately puberty, but how, how would you talk to yourself? Like what is considered normal in terms of growth and expectations of development. Oh, okay. So I didn't have precocious puberty, okay. but I did stop eating at 15. So I would tell myself and what I'm saying is that the things that you're worrying about aren't necessary. And that's why I talk so much about history. The ideal adolescent, how she's supposed to look is something that has been created in the 19th century to basically push women into a category of how they're supposed to be and not how they really are. Right. So how we're supposed to look, how we're supposed to eat, how we're supposed to, all these things were kind of put on our culture from, it goes back to the advent of agriculture, right? Their women are supposed to have babies and work in the fields or, or I don't know, you know, basically what the 19th century Victorian person had an idea of what women should look like and be like and think. That is not how the hunter-gatherer women evolved. That is not how, in many other countries in the world, it was the few countries that weren't heavy into agriculture. That is not how the women women grew up thinking they had to look the way we, me, as a fifteen-year-old, thought she had to look exactly like the the waif, the fainting waif that the Victorian girl thought she had to look like. Well, nowadays it's like, you need to be a very voluptuous. And so people start injecting things everywhere. So it's just, oh, it it's, changes, it changes every, it changes every decade. I mean, it, 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 it changes along with fashion. And, and I mean, that's why I talk about society. I mean, I talk about society so much, how the adolescent, the image that we have of what the adolescent female is supposed to look like and be and feel and feel, they told her how she was supposed to feel is caused by economics, social change, et cetera, et cetera. It's not how we are. So that's what women have to, girls have to think is, is, is what I'm trying to be. I wanted to be like Debbie Doyle and I wanted to have her pant size. So she was the most popular girl in my grade. If that is what you want, think about it. Is that what you are? I don't know if that makes any sense, but. No, it does. Yeah. When I, when I read your book and then I saw the history and then you shared about your children and it's like, wow, that disparity of even males and females and how we're treated in just similar illnesses. Um, it was so eye-opening because of the history of the context of what you shared and how it's 
I think reading your book helped me be empowered of even my childhood when I thought, how come all of my friends are getting their menses and I'm not getting it? Something's wrong with me. And then you start thinking, oh. well, my friend got on birth control and that helped her get it earlier. And, and so it was all of these things that I didn't know about or turn um, or someone that I could turn to. And when reading your book, you understand, oh, everyone is different and it's okay. And just know that as long as you feel healthy, as long as you're not having maybe symptoms, that everything you're going through is normal. And, and we don't get that in our role. We, in our society, we hear you should get your period by this date. And then if you're not, then you should take this medication. If you're having acne, not to worry, you could take this medication. If your cycle's not normal, or if there's heavier bleeding, not to worry, here's like the medication. And it's always a medication. I mean, obviously some of those symptoms are not ideal. If you, you can clean up first dietary and lifestyle changes, but it was very eye opening to see and I felt that there was a lot of empowerment in your book to understand that it is there is no one recipe to grow up. And then if you're not wired to look some like somebody else, that's okay, too. And we are all different instead of forcing something. And I think that was where I shared with you. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where my eating disorder stem from. As an Asian, I'm very tall. I'm five, eight, but all my friends are five, two and, and they're so thin. And so I always thought I'm the jolly green giant and I need to look like them or I, I can't shorten myself, but maybe if I just become like waif, like then I could yeah. be like them. And if I just accepted who I was and I, I didn't have any of that around me. So I think your book, I'm hoping that moms will get it. And then it will go to young children when they're, you know, not sure of what's going on with them. Like I'm having these changes. Is this normal? And for the most part, a lot of it can be normal if we understand our history and how a lot of the way that we view women has been shoved down us by actual by men and doctors and people right. that say women need to be like this. Right. And that this exactly. changes over the centuries or periods of time. Yeah, right. but it's also, you know, it's that's why I wrote the right, I wrote the book. But it's it. also the, the parents. So I mean, I talk oh, about yeah, this right, right. thing that happened. There was a huge, I mean, a lot of research into the tall girl syndrome. So mothers were actually taking their kids that they thought were going to be too tall and not get boyfriends or just be different and, and you know not be like that girl should be. Take her to get hormone pills so she wouldn't grow. Okay. Okay. So there's there's a lot of that. So we have to also and a lot of the issues during with the girls who were taken to doctors. In during the Victorian years, that horrific horrific things were done to them were taken by their mothers because they were the mothers were concerned that their daughter wouldn't be like the other girls. Right. So it's you know for the parents and the daughters and the, and the you know the children. No, absolutely. I mean the the statistics show that if a mother has an eating disorder, whether it's her behaviors, like certain words she uses, it totally triggers the risk of the daughter having an eating disorder. And to be fully candid a part of me didn't want a daughter because I didn't know if I'd accidentally, you know, have my daughter then learn behaviors. And thankfully I'm he healing now. So I don't think I'm using any words to do stuff like that, even to my boys, but it's just, yes, I think when mothers have children, we think they're our reflection. And so if we think anything is not part of the norm or when we get with our friends and their friends talk about their children going through something and it's not the same, we think we have to go and fix it. But sometimes it's not about necessarily fixing, especially with medication. Right. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for writing this book and for allowing me to just be a little bit of a part of it. I, I felt very honored. So thank you. I think it's so important. There's not enough information written about this. I learned so much from your book. Where can people find your book? What types of what? you know, different mediums are they and then where can people find you? So the book is available everywhere where there are books sold tomorrow, as of tomorrow, it's going to be available as a as an ebook, a paperback, and an audible. Mm -hmm. So not just Amazon, all of the other, you know, Barnes and Noble, Kobe stuff, I don't even know about because I'm in Italy. So yeah, and, and I have a website, elizbright.com. That's where people can write to me. And I just, I mean, I, I'm happy because the book is sort of a, their bookend, menopause, the beginning of fertility and the end of fertility. And it shouldn't be bad. Yeah. So that's what I'm writing. I love it. I love it. Thank you for supporting, especially women. I know the, I, you touch upon how males are also affected during the process too. But I, I appreciate that you give the, 
encouragement and empowerment to women to feel like it's okay. Like whatever we're going through, it's okay. And here are things that we can do um, in all periods of our life. And, and to normalize it instead of saying something's wrong, here's how to fix it. And I, I just see so much of the effects in our practice when women, whether, like you said, when they were young, they were put on something or when they're older, they're on something. And now they just don't feel as well as when they first got on it. And now they're doing all, they're trying to do all these things to rectify the situation. And sometimes it's just, it's hard. It's hard to get there if you've been on antidepressants or thyroid medications for decades. And now you're trying to eat a carnivore diet, but there's so much that we have to undo and it, it takes time. And it's, it's just, if I wonder how they would have been if they just read your book first. So yeah. thank yeah. you so much. Well, it's so good chatting with you again, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you have not checked out Dr. Elizabeth Bright's book, I think this recording is coming out a little bit after her book has launched, but make sure to pick it up and share it with people that, especially if they have younger daughters or if they're just having children that's going through puberty, it is such an important book to have context and understanding and really empowerment as you go through these changes in your body in the mental health, because your hormones are changing. And just to give yourself more support, so that you know what to do. And so that you can then support yourself for the next 50 60 years of having optimal health and hormone function and endocrine function. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat, take care of your bodies, because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys. 